can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I'm here with Devin McDonald of Karen's O'Neill. And Devin, I always like to, before I formally introduce you, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And since this is part of the top agency series, um, there's been some really cool uh, agency owners, Devin, on. I had Kevin Hergen, who's had an agency since 1995. So he talks about the evolution the services they offered, the uh, pivots they went through, the challenges, the ups, the downs. It's really fascinating to hear. So check the one out with Kevin Her- Hergen of uh, Spinatech. Um, I also had Todd Tasky on. Todd Tasky has a podcast called The Second Bite Podcast. He actually pairs agency owners with private equity and helps sell agencies. Um, he calls it Second Bite because when they sell, sometimes they make more on the second bite than they do on the first. He walks through his valuations, you know, what the the market is like and, you know, kind of his evolution. So that was a great episode as well. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. Devin, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company so they could run their business and develop amazing relationships and produce great content. Um, you know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I have found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com or email us support at rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce. Devin McDonald, he's president at Karen's O'Neill, one of Canada's leading independent media agencies. Devin was named the Media Leader of the Year in 2022 by Strategy Magazine as a past recipient of the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal for his work in the community. And Karen's O'Neill is a full service media agency specializing in strategy insights, media planning, media buying, and analytics. Uh, and Devin, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Talk about you know the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal. What what did you do there? Sure. So uh, a good place to start, which is about twenty years ago, where I was running a company that provided technology services to charitable organizations across Canada. Hardware, software, working. What is the internet? How do we do that? How do we raise money? How do we market ourselves? And I was able to work with a few hundred different organizations across the country. And in recognition of that and timed up at the Queen's Golden Jubilee anniversary of her being the Queen, I was a fortunate recipient of a, of a community award, which was what was that medal. Amazing. What brought you to Karen's O'Neill? Okay. So, I mean, 20 years ago, I was in the technology world. I started in technology. My, I was a data programmer in the previous millennium. And then all of my clients along the way, working for consulting firms or whatnot, ended up being sales and marketing departments. After spending too much time on the plane, working for those firms, I decided to get a real job, which I thought at the time, which was to go agency side. And I was in the creative world first. Um, running a couple teams and starting another company there, but realized that all the data and information was in the media side. And I left creative. We can go back to talk about a couple of those things, but to join and run a operating company for one of the global holding companies, but wanted to get to an independent to flex some more of some independent mindsets and some building capabilities and some entrepreneurial thirst that I had and that led me to Karen's O'Neill and I've been I've been here for just over two years now and I'm thrilled to be here talk about um the dynamic between so there's there's two founders 
Um, talk about the dynamic between bringing in a president. Like, what was your expectations? What was their expectations coming in? Uh, really good question. Thanks for the easy ones to start. Um, so David Cairns and Sherry O'Neill, you know, founded Cairns O'Neill uh, coming up to 12, coming up to 13 years ago, excuse me. And they are uh, noted veterans and respected leaders within the media world in Canada and recognized a void in the market where brands could usually only be serviced by large operating companies from holding companies or by smaller independents that didn't often lack that often lacked the the scale or technology to provide service so we provide service to mid-sized marketers and brands in canada that i call they operate with autonomy oh there's sherry there's david that's for sure and they have had a lot of success with their agency and we're looking to do more and wanted to bring in a president uh, to help them run their company and bring it into the next phase. I um, am that person and again, have been with them for two years now and trying to add some of my uh, capabilities and ambition to the existing teams and clients, which are quite strong. Um, but my my background adds a, a different level of um, of support and innovation to their company. What advice do you have, Devin, from a, let's say a founder is listening to this and they're like, I really want to bring on a president. Okay, what is the easiest way? It sounds like the transition was great when you you got on, but I don't know. I think sometimes working with founders is not so easy. Um, I could speak for myself. Maybe I'm not so easy to work with, but um, what advice do you have for founders bringing in president um, in onboarding them and transitioning to kind of relinquishing maybe control? Um, so, you know, coming into this, I'm well aware of a number of stories of failures. This does not, this success does not happen often. Because your company is your company. You have made it. You've decided in the name. You've decided in the logo. You have lost sleep, blood, money over it for years to get it to where you want it to be. Every founder has gone through this. And we've been successful in this transition. And my advice to other founders, one, make sure you know what you want. Make sure you are ready to give up some control because the person you hire, you want them to do what they're good at. You want them to activate their skills. You want them to activate their network. And if you don't, they're going to quit <laughs> and they're, they're going to leave. So be sure you're ready and then be sure you empower them. And then the way that you do those, both of those things, I think, and where we've had a lot of success, myself and David and Sher Sherry, we've been very upfront with each other from before I started with the role and going through the interview process, them testing me on my plan and me testing them on their plan to understand if there's a good fit for how we think and what our, our shared ambition is for the or distinct past, but shared plans for the future. How do they line up? And I'm, I'm very fortunate that to have such strong-minded founders that were committed to the plan, that have stuck to it. And I think because of that, we've had a, a, a tremendous amount of success. I love what you said there too, Nevin. There's two things. One, empowerment. And two, having a shared plan and vision um, talk about empowerment when you came on, because I know we're going to talk about how you, that's a big initiative for you with the team in general is empowerment, but how did they empower you when you, you first came on and then beyond? Um, a couple of ways. So first of all, we're able to really establish trust with each other early and, um, through transparency, through good discussions, through getting to know each other having a coffee, simple things. Uh, and it was during the pandemic. So some of those things were difficult where 
Yeah, we want to meet face to face. Okay, it'll be in a park in a lawn chair. That's great. Let's um let's do that. Take some humility and trust to get there. But um they they allowed me to take over their company. <clears throat> Excuse me. To prepare a plan and to execute it. They had feedback into it. They provided me context and advice. I'm open to the advice. I welcome the context. Every bit of information that they have around people or clients or history helps me do my job even better. So um, I think what has happened in a lot of other founders' cases is they might hire someone who comes in and thinks, oh, I have to change everything. Well, that's not going to work. You're going to repel. You're going to have the people rebel against you. The clients leave you. You have to fit into the system while complementing it. So that trust went a long way for them empowering me and, um, and, and, and building, that, building that vision together. And then we were also fortunate to have some early success with bringing in new services and bringing new clients. My method would be different than theirs. Everyone works differently than everyone else. And um, early success allowed us to build further trust, which led to further empowerment. You can't go wrong with new services and new clients, right? So how did you um, start that relationship? Where, did you have, were you in charge of a certain initiative? What was the kind of the impetus of, of starting that, that, the service and new clients? Um, well, for me, in, in joining the agency and agreeing to come on as president to help them transform, need to understand what do we have to start with and where are we? So let's look at some outputs of some reports. Let's look, look at some outputs of some strategy. What is the base technology that we're using to empower the decision making? And um, with my background in technology and in working for different operating companies, that helps me understand what we should do next. And while it was a great service and offering that was existing at the time, I knew how to level those things up, how to get buy-in from the team, how to business case it, and how to sell it into clients uh, in a great or simple value proposition for them that made it, made it easy for them to buy. So that's the thing with transformation is um, I do believe more in incremental improvement than complete turnaround, especially with a company that has such a great history and heritage in the market as, uh, as Karen's O'Neill does. Um, it's not a turnaround. It is the eternal startup. If you have to choose between those two things, we are an eternal startup. So uh, incremental improvement in technology is, is how we did that. So with the empowerment side, then talk about the plan side. Um, how did they test your plan? And then how did you test theirs? Start, start with yours. And this is be was this before you started? Did they say, come up with a plan? Like, walk me through it in, in detail. Did they come up with an X amount month plan? How did it actually work from the beginning? Yeah. Um, so I had to do two plans. This was in the discussion phase after the first coffee we're serious about each other okay well what would you do in the first 90 days and what would you do in the first five years and the i don't want to say the 90 days was easy but the 90 days is tested and true there's good um books and processes and methods out there about what to do in terms of evaluating in my Consultancy background helps me go through that and to break things down in big pieces. Um, the five year was difficult and harder uh, because I wasn't sure exactly what I had and what exactly good or bad was was with the agency. Happy to find many good things, and I always. Um, Hope for the worst, but plan for the best. In that um, it requires a good balance of uh, honesty and pessimism with optimism to get there. And so simply though, 
the way I look at it, the way I look at media and our position in the industry, we, because of our size and scale, we can operate as fast as we want to. We can change faster than our competitors. And that gives us uh, such an advantage. So my five-year plan was based on change and how to amplify uh, the, the, the strengths that an agency like Cairns O'Neill had. I want to talk about the 90-day and five-year for a second. but And I'm, I'm guessing the answer, but I don't know. In the change, right? In that five-year plan was AI in that plan at all? I mean, at that point, when you started... I mean, AI wasn't huge or anything. Obviously, now it's it's a hot topic. Was that even in the realm of your thinking at the time? Is a five year plan? Uh, not in the way that we're using it today. No, not at all. And, and um, you're a software. I mean, you come from coding and development too. So it's it's you've yeah. seen the kind of evolution of that. What was in, in the form of in your in your five year plan? What was in there? You mean uh, in that realm, in that category, yeah. the activating data, for sure. You know, I think for a lot of brands, uh, the data that they have is one of the most valuable resources. And building tools and platforms that connect data stronger together and lets you do more modeling, makes, more th makes things more automated, is a real pain point for a lot of agencies and a lot of clients who have too much information. And so a big part of the plan is activating data platform, activating and creating data platforms to improve decision-making, improve speed through automation. But I, I don't think if I look back that artificial intelligence would have been in the, in the five year or 90 day. Yeah, I mean, connecting data, automation, activating data platforms. Now you could just do that using quicker, easier, probably with AI, imagine. Um, we'll go back to the 90 day, but on the AI topic, um, what are you doing with AI? I know you're doing some innovative things in, in that realm. For sure. So it's such an exciting space. I don't think humanity is over. I don't think that creativity is dead either. I think it's a, an amazing additive tool for every marketer to put in their toolkit. And so back in the winter or just 10 months ago, nine months ago, the generative AI tools, the large language models were being available in the public. Fascinating times, fascinating to see a world of possibilities as they begin to continue to develop. Um, and we saw in there an opportunity in that if you're able to teach a language model about a brand, it can tell a story or give information about a brand. And in my simple data processing mind, that is an output. And um, AI-based programmatic or dynamically creative or dynamic uh, optimization, creative, dynamic creative optimization, but a jumble, <laughs> uh, requires an input. And so as though two, those two simple things that I talked to the team about to say, we have these tools available. We have lots of willing, ambitious clients. Let's connect those two pieces together and really build a first of its kind tool that can take uh, ad copy from a language model, put it into a ad server, and optimize it for effectiveness. I believe we're the first to do it. I have not heard someone else do this. I've been waiting to see what else someone can do. Um, but in the meantime, we continue to, we've developed a product roadmap for 2024. We have an exciting launch coming up soon um, about that. And um, it's such an exciting space where there's so much possibility um, for brands and for an agency like ours as well. Devin, let's talk about that for a second. You know, you are very technical, okay? In general, you have skills. It sounds like you just empowered the team to do this and you kind of stood back a little bit. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but what did you, you know, just for people listening, 
obviously everyone would be like, hey, here's the issue, go solve it. Um, talk about how you guided the team, you empowered the team and guided them to, to come up with a solution to what you were looking for. Sure. Um, so uh, I have a technical background for sure. I don't know if I'd be able to use a coding interface today. I think they're they're well beyond me now. But I do have a base understanding of how the systems work and how the machines connect. And I generally know that you can connect any two things together. So I don't trust people when they say they can't. <laughs> uh, second is I understood the opportunity for us and what it would mean for our client to be able to produce this produce and optimize this volume of client. What I didn't know was the middle piece. And so talking to the team and really saying to them, we have the tools, we have the technology, we have the vision, we have the clients, we have the budget. We have no other barriers. Take the time, invest the time. This is the number one thing for us to focus on. You get to build something from scratch for yourself, for the company. Let's do it. And um, really the, the speech was, why not you? Why, why couldn't you create this? Why couldn't we create this for our clients? Why not? And um, that helped them, I, I hope, I think. And uh, I encourage them and push them as much as I can and giving them the platform and time to, to do it today. I'm curious to know, and maybe maybe you're not in the weeds enough to know this, but I'm curious, what software tools did you look at or did you end up using in, in this space? So I know two of them. And then the middleware stuff, I have no idea. So uh, it was a chat GPT model that we used. And we isolated a version of that model to teach it about uh, a couple of our clients. And then we have an ad server partner called Adform, who's been fantastic and has great engineering resources. And so the ad server is essential for the input and delivering it out to the outside world. And what our teams were able to do was to how, figure out how to codify the API from ChatGPT into Adform. And to one open technology and one proprietary technology. So that, that took some work. What the work was and what the weeds were, you're right, Jeremy. I, I don't know, but uh, I know it, I knew it would be possible. It's like when I go in and flip a light switch on, I don't know what necessarily all the physics behind it, but I do know the light turns on. So <laughs> sure, what's AC, what's DC? Who knows? <clears throat> but the lights go. Um so I could see it's interesting your five year plan, and I I think I love hearing how you think it was just connecting data automation, activating data platforms to help companies get to the next level, not just yours but others. What was in the ninety day plan? Like someone's like, hey, I, I just need a rock solid. How did you do the research on that? Because again, you weren't you weren't on board yet at that point. How did you do the research to come up with that? And, and what was in the 90-day plan? I'm scanning back to my brain about what was in there exactly. It would have been about two and a half years ago when I wrote that. But I know it would have started from a place of learning and talking to the clients and talking to the people. Um, my, my job in the 90 days was for them to get to know me and me to get to know them, to make sure I met with every employee and every client just to say hello, I'm an unknown entity coming into their business, coming to their lives, and change in being part of change in a company where for 10 years, David and Sherry were leading the company. Here comes the new guy. So it's getting them, them getting to know me, me assuring them that uh, I'm here to support them and empower them, and for the clients to know that too. That would have been two thirds of it. The other parts of it, so on, on clients and on people, the other component would have been around our technology and our product. And that's a media strategy product, media planning product, and the technology platforms we have. And it's really to get in a little deeper at a client by client level 
at a per platform level to really see where we were and to really understand what we could do next. It takes time. Um, but the relationships with the staff, teams, and clients are the first part of that. Um, they're the ones who created these tools. They're the one who created these plans. I want to help them. I want to support them and add, add to what they've done. Yeah, I mean, I could see those those pieces are are important. And especially when starting a relationship, they're testing your plan. But you're testing theirs as well. How did you test? I don't know if you remember, because it's been a couple of years, but how did you test their plan uh, versus yours? So I was able to see, of course, a lot of financial statements and uh, structure of the company, and that, that was fine. But that doesn't answer the real questions. Um, things like client longevity, client tenure, staff longevity, staff tenure, staff promotion throughout their tenure, how have people grown? That, that, tells, that tells you a lot about, um, about the strength of a company and the strength of a servicing group. And the agency certainly had that. But in testing their plan, it was, you know, that we have a high amount of accountability between each other, um, between myself and the, and the partners, to make sure that we stick to the plan. And so at the beginning, uh, it was a, before day one, a lot of open discussions, a lot of going back. Let's make sure we're clear here. We had a great racy chart that probably had 50 things on it that talked about um, where I would have autonomy, where I would not. And I, I was comfortable, comfortable with that for sure. And then on the product side of things and, and going in, so um, being able to see things in advance, understanding the context is important. But they also let me and insisted I make my own, I, I create my own opinions. And they wanted me to have the flexibility to um, learn in an unbiased way. And that, that told me so much about them as leaders and about what they wanted me to do um, and to form my own opinions and, and plans based on what I saw. Again, what the strengths were and what the opportunities were. It sounds like, Devin, they really shared a bunch of information with you, um, financial, staff, and other information that allowed you to get uh, a good picture, at least a, at least a glimpse of not just financial pieces, but but the staff as well and the services. Absolutely. A good way to summarize it. And uh, yeah, they did share a lot of information with me, which which really helped me understand. You know, they were a competitor before. And so um, you don't learn a, a lot about things. You, you learn stuff through press releases, and that's great. But um, it doesn't tell the whole story. And um, there, there, there was definitely more for me to learn. And even a sign that they were so willing to share that with me was um, built trust early with me. And you don't have to say your specific scenario, but how should founders incentivize bringing someone in to take more control over their company? Should someone just be thinking of um, compensation benefits? Should people be thinking of giving equity stake in uh, or vesting over a period of time? <clears throat> what are ways that founders can attract really good uh, talent and to help run their company? Well, I think I think all those components are very important in the financial aspect of things. Um, and I was fortunate in coming into this, these discussions and coming to this opportunity. I have uh, friends involved in M&A as, as lawyers, as financiers, or who have gone through this as a seller or purchaser or a new president with other agencies. So I had, a, I had a lot of people to talk to and to understand their experience. But 
the most important thing for a founder is to be clear on their goal. What do they want to do? And that, for me, was a test as well. And um, for people who work for me, they know when I say, what is your plan? I, I really want to know what the plan is. And um, I was able to share that with David and Sherry, and they were able to share their plan with me. And so it's our goals aligned. And yes, incentives and compensation and other things, they line up to it. But without alignment and understanding of goals and a clear understanding from the founder of the goals, none of that stuff matters. What should someone like you be asking when they come in from a succession standpoint? Right. Because that is kind of a goal. Like we're bringing a president, we're stepping away. What does that look like? Uh, is part of the conversation should they be having is um, intention of when do you want to sell or the person is going to take over? What, how does that conversation go? Yeah. So, uh, one example one of the founders, uh, uh, David, he uh, was promoted to executive chair of the company. Uh, about six months or so after I started. <laughs> and um, what was important uh, for me to understand and the questions I had of David and Sherry and I had of David, well, you want to be executive chairman. What does that mean to you? How involved do you want to be? What does that mean to the racy? Do you want to be on a weekly status call? Do you want to see the operating plan every quarter? What's it going to take for you to feel comfortable in your new role? And those are all open discussions across 50 points, 100 points to have to, to understand what their plans are and, and what they want to do. So for me, coming into it, what's going to be in clear articulation? It's, and anyone coming in in my position to take over a comp to take over running a company, you have to make sure that your goals are aligned and that responsibilities are clear. If, the, if they're not, um, you're going to have trouble very early. And um, that, that trouble will lead to conflict and conflict will lead to failure. Let's talk about culture for a second, Devin. And because it seems like, you know, from the beginning, you have this, you know, culture of empowerment. What are some of the things you do is a company that's built in some examples of building culture. Sure. Super difficult in these new worlds for me and for a lot of other agency leaders or listeners, I think when you have some people working from home, some people from the office, some people from Thailand, wherever they might be, they're all over the place. And so our definition of culture used to be the office and used to be hanging out together. And that doesn't happen in a physical sense anymore, as strongly as it used to. And it, it, it's quite difficult to recreate that, I find, in a, in a digital form. You have to be intentional um, with people and with teams to um, and over-communicate your goals and vision with them to make sure they understand what they are and, and they, they believe in it and align to it. So building a sense of empowerment as an example is by leading with example and letting people and making sure people take credit for the work that they've done. It also means that we encourage people and over communicate with themselves to, to share what, what terrifies me about remote working is people being um, digitally isolated from their colleagues to learn and to, to, to hear from each other. The water cooler talk about what's happening with client X no longer exists. And so the learning of osmosis does not happen. So we're very focused uh, on training people and helping people improve their careers through training and through work. Which to me, um, for our culture in being insights led and strategically driven, I, I think that's how uh, people can improve in their work and um, how, we, how we can showcase it best as an employer and company. 
What are some of the things that you do in the remote setting to foster culture? Like you said, before you're talking around the water cooler, you're hanging out. What are you doing remotely to foster that? So what I would say, first of all, is that I do believe there are absolutely uh, a lot of things that are more efficiently done when people are working remotely. On the flip side of that, I do absolutely believe that there are things that are done more efficiently together in person. And so we're very, we're very transparent with teams about that. We talk about that with them, how to get the best out of your work and how to get the best out of each other. And so for people working remotely, and we have a full flex policy, which I say is what people do what they want, um, which mean could mean never coming in, which could mean coming in every day and everywhere in between. But for those individuals and their managers, they need to stay on top of each other. And I don't mean in a micromanagement way. I mean, in how are things going? What are you up to? Where are you? What, where do you need help? How can I support you? And those casual discussions that you used to count on and walking by someone's desk 17 times a day, I believe those need to be recreated. And that doesn't mean 17 Zoom calls a day. I hope it doesn't. Um, and that's a complete waste of time. Um, but it's it actually takes more effort, I think, to do it. But it, it's worth it for people just to over communicate with them, to overshare, and and to stay in touch with them. What's a cadence meeting? That I don't know. What cadence meetings do you have on a weekly basis? Me, I meet with our leadership team as a group every other week. And then one-on-one, -on -one, there'd be six people within the leadership team. And it's up to them. Uh, I leave it up to them. They can meet. We can meet once a week for half an hour. We can meet once a month for an hour. Um, and then we stay in touch ad hoc through messages or, or email, of course, on, on important issues. But as the leadership team, it's important for us to be aligned and to, to share and to over communicate about issues because of the way they impact other teams in the company. What's important to have, you know, one on one from a format perspective? Oh, well, um, an agenda, of course, is important and a short agenda. It can't be 20 things long. If it's 20 things long, you're not meeting regularly enough or you have too many priorities. So a short agenda is important. Um, and if you haven't met with them in a while, um, making sure you talk about personal stuff first. How are you doing? Where are you at? How are you feeling? Is there something we can talk about or you need help with? And then getting into the problem solving or updates as required. But that list should be should be short, shouldn't be any surprises, and should be about moving things forward. Devin, I want to talk a little bit about what you do as a company. Um, and can you walk me through a little bit of an example would be like a leading telecommunications company and what you did with them? Sure. So we do have a client who's a leading telecommunications company, and they provide a variety of services across mobile, internet, uh, home phone, cable, all those good things uh, to a, a wide swath of customers. And it's a super competitive business, as, a, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, driven by rates and driven by performance of the networks that they're on. And so for us, um, working with our client uh, in this space, it's a, a great client because they do have so much ambition and they do have so much need and they believe in advertising which is the most important thing for any, any client. And so we use things like our transparent trade desk to model customer behavior, ingest first party data on our DMP to understand the signals and triggers that we can go and uh, apply against unknown audiences for acquisition purposes, get people into stores and use modeling to on, through search and programmatic to understand what is doing the best work to get people into stores. And of course, elevating the brand. I'm excited for this one client in particular. They have a new brand platform coming out this fall. 
we all know uh, how much brand does help improve performance. Study after study shows this, and uh, we preach this, a balance is so important. And also integrate understanding and helping them evaluate how the inner workings of technology within their company can be activated within media. And for, for too many firms, there are silos between technology and marketing where the customer data platform choices and signals really matter and can be activated and empowered further within media, all privacy compliant and all that good stuff. But um, there, there's so much resources available uh, for media to activate on. And, and that's the part for, uh, for our, my teams and, and myself where we, we feel we can really help accelerate media and not just rely on media performance, but actual business performance. It's, um, it's so important to us. First of all, I just want to thank, I have one last question, Devin. Before I ask it, I'd love to hear some of your favorite resources. Uh, whether it's books, uh, podcasts, could be on leadership or business. Um, before we get into that part, I just want to thank you for for sharing your expertise. I want to encourage people to check out the website, um, which is c a i r n s o n e i l dot com to learn more. Um, talk about some of your favorite resources from a leadership or business perspective. Well, uh, I'm very fortunate. I've had some great leaders as bosses throughout my career. They remain friends. I text them or call them when I need help. Uh, and uh, and they do now me, which is a, a strange turn of events, um, but uh, but welcome. And so that professional network is my, is my number one source. My number two source, um, I like to read books. I read very few marketing books. I mostly read books about artists or individuals who have worked through challenges and, and had success. Uh, my two favorite books that I've read recently that I've recommended to people heavily are Rick Rubin's latest book and Sinead O'Connor's biography, which she wrote before she passed away. Just as She wrote two summers ago before she passed away this summer. Both incredible creators who see the world very differently than you and I, because I, I have a fundamental belief that um, we're just stuck to my ideas, we're, we're in big trouble. And so I like to hear different perspectives from people and uh, books like that are where I get my ideas and have the ability to, to think differently about things. Devin, I'll be the first one to thank you Thank you so much for sharing your journey, your knowledge. This is fascinating. Everyone check out more episodes of the podcast and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Devin. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.